Good evening, everyone, and uh, thank you so much for coming to our virtual um, Alaska Photographic Center lecture for Rarified Light tonight. Um, we didn't have one last year uh, in person, and uh, it was all virtual, and um, this year is uh, still virtual. We erred on the side of caution. Um, the show, Rarified Light, will be um, a physical show, but uh, um, our Dura Eddie Soloway is in, uh, in Santa Fe, and uh, I guess all of us are spread all over the place. So um, thank you for attending tonight and being so understanding. Um, my name is Petra Leshetsky, for those of you who don't know me. Um, I'm an APC board member and I live in Anchorage. Um, I have a few um, announcements to make tonight and uh, then I'll introduce Eddie and um, say a few words about him. But uh, before I do that, I want to say thank you to all the photographers who have entered our show this year. Um, kudos to you for being flexible and imaginative and um, hopefully many of you are here tonight to, to see Eddie's lecture. Um, we had 90 photographers participating and uh, 586 images were entered. It's been such a crazy time. And um, again, thank you to all of you. And I also want to take the opportunity to thank my, my fellow board members for all the work that's gone into this. All of us have done our share, but I think the one person who deserves a special thank you is Jason Lazarus, who um, has been guiding us <laughs> through all the online uh, tribulations and uh, he's our our virtual guru hero whatever you might say so thank you jason for all of your for all of your time and uh, and work um so eddie has chosen 51 images for the show um rarefied um lie 2021 will be a show, a physical show at the International Gallery opening on first Friday in October. And uh, that's actually going to be the first of October this year. Um, I do have the pleasure to announce the honorable mentions and the best of show tonight. The rest of the show, the photographers who will have images in the show will be announced next week, but um, here comes the envelope, it's opened. And uh, so uh, honorable mentions are the following. We have Trevor Jones from Anchorage um, for Novel Family. We have Susan Johnson from Kasilov for The Sky is Crying. We have Brianna Peterson from Kodiak for In Between. Javid Kamali from Anchorage for Three Second Backward Tie, and Dean Kali from Anchorage for Valley Thaw number one. Best of show is Bob Hallinan from Anchorage with Ravens. Congratulations to all of you. Um, I am so looking forward to seeing the show. And there are prizes attached to the honorable mentions and of course, best of show. And we will be in touch with all of you to make sure that uh, we get them to you. So um, Rarified Light um, has been going for a long time and we have had workshops um, with the show. Eddie has been to Anchorage before it's some time ago. Um, so we are very excited to have him back here. Uh, well, not physically in, uh, in Anchorage, but uh, he will do our workshop this weekend, which is going to be virtual. And he will talk about that just a, a little bit. Um, he um, is a photographer 
a teacher and a storyteller. His imagery to me is magical. Um, the workshop he'll teach um, is called A Natural Eye. Um, he um, has taught for leading photographic institutions around the world. In fact, he's just come back from Italy. And uh, I said earlier to him, he must be very jet lagged. And he said he doesn't want to think about it. So uh, I'm amazed he's still standing. But um, anyway, um, he has won numerous awards, one of which is uh, excellence in photographic teaching. And it's from the Center in Santa Fe. He has also authored a book called 1000 Moons. Um, Eddie, we are so excited to have you with us, even if not in person. Hopefully one of these days in the not too distant future, we can welcome you back to the state um, in person. But um, we want to thank you for being so flexible and understanding and uh, we can't wait for seeing your images and listen to your lectures and we'll do it with our eyes wide open so uh, thank you so much and uh, i'll hand over to you thank you so much Petra. i was thinking one of my big regrets is that tomorrow morning i was planning on walking down the block to uh as I remember Snow City Cafe to get an incredible breakfast. So uh, that'll be delayed until sometime in the future. So I want to say just a couple words about the juring and then jump into my presentation. I, um, I remember when I would jury into a show, I would submit something. And if I got in, I thought, boy, that judge is the best in the world. And then if I didn't, I go, oh, what does he know, right? So it's tough, right? There are almost 600 entries and what, the unique thing about this show was it didn't have a concept around it like abstracts or street photography. It was open. I love all genres of photography, from everything from landscapes that I work in to street photography, to figure, to portrait, to war photography, and so forth. So I went into this thinking about what makes an amazing photograph. And for me, there's different answers to that. One is something that, that I can't let go of that I hold on to, that stays with me after I've, I've stopped looking at it. One is a photograph that asks a question, makes me wonder a little bit, makes me wonder what's going on, makes me get involved more. One is a photograph in today's world of everything being so instant, a photograph that lets me hang out. And the more I hang out, I see more, more is revealed. So there's many things that make an interesting photograph. And as I got down closer and closer and closer to the 50 to 55 I needed to pick, I found that cream rose to the top, quite truly. I would put things together. Maybe I would put three or four winter abstracts together. And sure enough, one would rise up. And it could be that something came down a bit because there, something wasn't quite right with focus, exposure, so on and so forth. I'll leave you with two thoughts before I jump into what my presentation, which is the during process for me, if I, at my best, when I embraced it, I learned a lot from it. I learned sometimes that I wasn't ready for a show or that indeed I wasn't as good as someone that was selected ahead of me. It was one thing that came out of it too. Um, but, but the second idea, the second thing is it's really just, well, no, I should have lost my train of thought there for a second. But the second thing goes back to something Ansel Adams said years ago, a long time ago. He talked about photography being sort of two parts. Making the picture was writing this, the score and making the print was performing the symphony. Well, I'm passing it off now to the 51 of you to show up with a beautiful print. The most difficult thing about juring is I'm looking at a JPEG and I have no idea what the file's like. Is it good enough to make a big print? Is the integrity of the digital negative there for you to move forward and interpret in a beautiful way? So good luck on that. It's, they're beautiful photographs, all of them were, and um, I hope it's a magnificent show. So thank you for letting me be a part of that. I wanna jump into my presentation. I'm gonna share my screen here and I'll let Jason holler if something's not working and he can slow me down. Right now, I just wanna to go to my title slide for a moment. Tell you a story because I juried into a lot of shows myself or tried to. I first made a living in photography by trying to sell my photographic prints at outdoor art shows all across the country. 
And in the day when I was doing this as my main thing, I would apply to often 50, 60 shows a year, hoping I might get into about 15. And then I would piece together a schedule and bring my 10 foot by 10 foot booth around the country. I was at a show in Southern Arizona when a magnificent story showed up at the end of a dismal show. Three day show, promoters said there were about 100,000 people that came through. And I, oh, I think there were 200 of us, sculptors, painters, photographers, ceramicists, and so forth. And I was hardly selling a thing, I was miserable. Sunday afternoon, a man came into my booth and asked me a question that all of you get, your friends ask you, which is, he looked at my prints for a moment and he said, hey, what kind of camera do you have? Right, it's a question you get all the time. Well, I, I've answered that differently over time. I sometimes would look at the print and try and remember the camera because I knew we would want to know the lens and the film in those days. At that time, when he came into my booth, I answered it by being quite honest, but more general. I said, these were made with large format, medium format, 35 millimeter cameras, which was true. The lenses varied and the films varied. Well, he didn't get the answer he wanted when he asked me, what kind of camera did you use? And off he went. And that's when a man came up to me who was in the corner of the booth and he gave me a beautiful story. He said, I just heard your exchange. And he said, I, here's a story. He had just been invited evidently to a small music college to hear one of the world's best violinists perform. And he said afterwards, what was unique was everyone had a chance to ask questions. So in this acoustically perfect small auditorium, he played, magnificent. And afterwards, a young student stood up and raised his hand, the musician called on him, he said, wow, your violin makes incredible music, right? To which evidently the musician, musician held the violin out at arm's length and said, I don't hear a thing. And I love that story. I wanted to start with that because to me, photography is about seeing. It's not about the stuff. The stuff enables us to get to the end, but it's about how we see and how we feel and how we think. So with that, I'm going to move forward into seven ideas. Seven ideas to help, oh, turn the creative pot, to stir up the creativity in our photography. The first one, I'm not gonna tell you what the first one is until I share you some examples with you. I, a month ago, I made this photograph. I was on the Big Sur coast of California. Yeah, I got there in the mid afternoon. I wanted to work at twilight, but I always show up early so I can get to know the place a little bit, see how the waves are working, what's going on. And I noticed that every time a wave went down, sunlight was sparkling on pieces of kelp. And I kept being, pull, I kept being pulled down further and further into the kelp and, and intrigued by it. And next thing you know, I'm lying in the wet sand. Whenever a wave went out, I would lie down and try and play with surreal focus on pieces of the kelp, which is what this is. And then a wave would come in and I'd get up and run, try and get away from the wave. Several years ago, I was walking along the Appalachian Trail in Maine and I looked down about 20, 30 feet down into a gorge. The river was flowing and I noticed some color. So it pulled me down. I got in about thigh deep and this is what I saw. I was down in Baja, Mexico. Beautiful evening on the Pacific. Some boats out in the ocean, but pretty gentle. It's been a pretty wild day, but the waves were pretty calm. And I wanted to know what would happen with this little light coming from a hut behind me over the long exposure of the stars. Right, from top, I was looking down this beautiful mushroom. And I was curious what light would look like from coming through from underneath it. So I laid down to photograph this. This was made the same afternoon as the piece of kelp that was out of focus I showed you to begin with. And I noticed that waves were coming in gently over this little bit of beach. And I was curious about showing motion and stillness together, what that might look like. Last summer being, or last winter being locked into the house when during the pandemic or into our neighborhood, I started photographing colors through icicles that were hanging from the house. So all these photographs, all these photographs were driven by this first point I want to leave you with, which is having an incredible curiosity, curiosity, insatiable curiosity, just being so hungry about, I wonder what's going on. This last pandemic brought me to some things that were not necessarily photographic. I started photographing. I noticed one day on the driveway, see if this video works. We'll see Jason if it actually works on Zoom. But I noticed these ants were carrying these magenta petals across the driveway. And I wonder if it was a one-off thing. And I went, 
every day I went out, no, there was always an ant carrying a magenta petal across the driveway. And I was so curious about where were they going? This is my bad iPhone video, but this is where this little ant was going. It was going all across the driveway, right in front of the studio where I am right now. This is the easier part of the journey, easy part of the journey here. And then across this tumultuous up and down landscape, it took about 37 to 45 minutes, pandemic, right? I had time to figure this out. And back to the mother home, which is coming up here where it would bring this magenta petal in. Hundreds of ants were bringing these petals in all the way back here to the main home. I was learning about my neighborhood. As a matter of fact, I bought a $100 night camera and I put it out back to see who my neighbors were. Just a cheap, inexpensive, I guess they use it for hunting, things of that sort. And I just wanted to see what was going on. And so I just noticed my, uh, my audio cut off, my video cut off again there, but I will fix that. Let me see if I can switch that here. Jason, are we okay if I just go for a while without it? That's fine. Yeah, it's more important to see the photographs than me at this point. So what I wanted to do, was see who my neighbors were. I heard some of them at night, but I hadn't seen them. And I made all kinds of silly, fun photographs of me at times changing the, uh, the battery. But then I found some cool things going on, which was when things unexpectedly would happen. A bird would take off or land. A great horned owl would take off. It's really fun. See, curiosity isn't just about when the camera's in your hands. For me, curiosity also kicks in with art of all sorts. I go to museums and I'm voracious about trying to understand painters, for instance. Turner's stormy avalanches, fires, seascapes inform me when I go to the ocean to make this photograph. And it's not so much, it's not so much that I'm thinking of Turner at that moment, but I've let Turner come into me. A friend of mine is a printmaker here in Santa Fe, Ron Picasso. Ron made this. And Ron talks in his monotypes and printing about making marks, black marks on his pieces. I took a class from Ron and afterwards I started seeing black marks in my streams. I think it informed me by being curious. I sat in front of a giant Jackson Pollock in the museum, museum of Modern Art in New York City. And for the first time understood the rhythm that people talked about by sitting in front of a giant Pollock. I was on my way up to Maine in autumn and darned if I didn't see Pollock in the stream. So the first point, the first of the seven is to have this insatiable curiosity insatiable curiosity, whether it's with your camera in hand, looking at art, doing something around your house, whatever it may be. I, um, the the second, second point has to, is really to hang out with children, hang out with the little people. Gwen Frostick, who was a printmaker in Michigan, told this story. She said that a little boy was going to go from kindergarten to first grade. And he was in the summertime, he was brought in by the school district to better understand what class you should be placed in. They wanted to give him a test and see what class you should be in in first grade. And one of the questions he was asked was, what do you get when snow melts? To which Gwen said, he answered springtime. <laughs> no. Well, I guess the examiner said, I'm gonna ask you this one more time because it's a very serious question. What do you get when snow melts? And Gwen said the little boy froed his brows and thought very seriously and said, I'm going to stick with springtime. I love that story. I'd love to know where this little boy is right now. So seeing the world like a child. Gwen, uh, not Gwen uh, Frostick, I just told you about, but Rachel Carson wrote a magnificent book. Well, she wrote several. You, you know Silent Spring about the problem with DDT moving through, through the food chain. But she wrote A Sense of Wonder. And it was about her time with her nephew on the coast of Maine. And she said she wished she could give every child in the world a sense of wonder so indestructible it would last throughout life. So indestructible it would last throughout life. I'm just looking over here to see if I can, for a moment, get my, my video back up here. Give me a second to see if I can do that. I realize it should probably be visible here. I'm going to switch to this video here. You see me in a different way, but at least I'm there. So back up for a second. I was talking about Rachel Carson and hanging out with the chil with children. Another image I made was inspired by children in a big way. I was um, reading Sword in a Stone a long time ago. Maybe you read it too. And it was about a young boy. He's going to become King Arthur. 
And one of his teachers along the way was Merlin, Merlin, the, the wizard, the magician. And Merlin at one point turned the young boy into different animals to get an animal's eye view on the world. He turned him into an ant, he turned him into a fish and into a hawk. I thought that's a magnificent way to see the world. So when I saw this mushroom up in Denali, I had a choice. I can make it all in focus as if it was go inside a field guide to mushrooms, or I could think, huh, I wonder what it looked like if a leprechaun came by and sat underneath it. Of a childlike thought. More thoughts on this childlike view on the world. I was with a friend of mine who she, she was 85 at the time, very, but very much a child. And we were sitting on her porch in Wisconsin, which faced east. This is on the Pacific Ocean, the image you're seeing here. But Jane would often finish the day drinking her bourbon old fashions, looking out on the, on the long field on the east side. And she said, you know, Eddie, at the market tomorrow, all the neighbors are going to get together and talk about their sunsets and how magnificent the sunset was. What they're missing is the back of the stage. I get this beautiful glow back here on the east that people miss. And so she turned to me and she said, don't forget to turn around and look at the back of the stage. I love that thought. I was in the Pacific Ocean right here where you're seeing photographing waves. And I thought about Jane, I went, turn around, look at the back of the stage. And at that moment, this beautiful sunset was lighting up the orange logs, already orange and making them glow even more. I take this back of the stage into all different genres in different ways. You're photographing a graduation, what's going on behind the scenes. You're looking at a plant, maybe lie underneath it. It's that idea of seeing it from different perspectives. So we're still on this idea of, um, of young children, the second idea, hang out with children. The thing that happens with a little person if you're with them, and I've, I've joked before that if you're ever stuck in your photography, you should go borrow a four-year-old you'll wanna return this little creature at the end of the day, but they're amazing because they see first time moments every day. And the problem for us is we, we don't, we, we're jaded. We don't even know what happened between one stoplight and the next if we're not paying attention. I mean, I've been real lucky in my photography. I've been able to travel from photography to places that are far away from home and see amazing things, you know, to see that in 10 minutes, a baby zebra can be born, stand up, learn to walk, it has to basically because there's hyenas and lions and things like that all around. But the point is, I sometimes had to travel far to see first time moments, but that's a trap. This mama, by the way, had four little rascals and being a cheetah and the predator, the lion world or the cat world is not easy. They're at the low end of the totem pole, below, below the, uh, the lions and the jaguar, the, yeah, the lions and the jaguars and the, not the jaguars, what am I thinking of, but, um, and hyenas as well too. But my point is that I need to see first time things every day. A friend's kitchen window in Vermont one January froze up like this. It was beautiful. We're just having breakfast or fire, sparks from a fire, the smoke from a fire. See, if I wait for those moments in the Serengeti, it's going to be far and few between these photographs. I need to have first time moments and see like a child on a regular basis. But an unnamed pond had the snow blown away from it and the ice itself looked like constellations. This reminds me of Van Gogh's Starry Night. And what it was, it was a piece of wood that had been discarded on the shore of a lake in Norway. And I just came in for a close composition to not reveal what it was. I sometimes think that revealing a piece of something can be as powerful as showing the whole. So I wanted to re reveal a piece of it. But my whole point in this is that keep those child children's eyes inside you. A childlike sense of wonder has to guide me every day. It can't just guide me when I go to somewhere special, far away. Well, so a third idea that I wanna leave you with has to do with being well, breaking out of your box, being playful. And this is the photograph I'll show you in a second that really got me going. I was driving to art shows, like I implied earlier, I made a living selling my prints at outdoor art shows. I was always like a bat out of hell trying to get somewhere because I was printing, matting and framing to the wee hours. And then I had 1400 miles to go to Chicago and I was late. It was always ironic to me that I was like, you know, stressed and driving fast and, and late to go sell my contemplative photographs of nature. But one day I had a little bit more time and I was driving through the summer monsoonal system that we have right now in the Southwest with big thunderstorms. We hope to bring us much needed moisture. 
And I was in Arizona heading to the Bay Area in California when I saw lightning in front of me. I didn't feel I had time to pull over, put my camera on the tripod, open the shutter to bulb and to see what would happen. And that's when this whimsical thought came into me that's been one of my mantras since. It was, I wonder what would happen if I put my camera on the steering wheel, open the shutter to bulb and drive into the storm. It was film, so I didn't get this back for a couple weeks later, but I was so excited. See, you can see the bolts of lightning. I was lucky. I tried this many times. And uh, if you can see my cursor, the lights in the lower left were headlights coming at me. Not really. I was on the interstate. And these are my headlights in the lower right. But I was so excited. It sort of recharged my, my thinking out of the box. At the same time, Kodak gave me a little digital point and shoot camera, one of the first. It was like 1998. Do you remember these? You'd press a shutter, and about a second later, it would take the picture. Well, I put it in my pocket and used it on my driving to the art shows. And all of a sudden, this time I didn't like became so energized. And it was the exact opposite of my photography in nature. At that time, I was using 50 speed film on a tripod, everything in focus front to back. And I was now going to document my, my road trips. Sometimes you could see something recognizable, in this case, the St. Louis Arch. But usually it was just my take just what I saw. I had two rules and you, you promise me you won't do the first one, which was I had to make the photograph while driving. So don't do that one. But the second one is I couldn't get off the interstate and go back and do it again because I missed it. It was so much fun. A whole new body of work showed up in an unexpected way and a, and a genre I wasn't expecting. Cameras got better much better. This one I made with a more serious DSLR, you know, driving fast on the interstate. It was amazing what these cameras could do. Uh, this one I call Big Dipper at 70 miles an hour. It looks like you can see the dipper in here. It looks like I signed a print down in there. But my favorite images from this series were the funky ones, the ones with big chunks of digital grain, digital noise in there, everything we try to avoid these days, it was sitting in there. But I got to a point where I felt like I couldn't take one more picture. I was, I was, you know, I finished it. And then one night in the Florida Panhandle, I made this photograph where I said to myself, I wonder if I can make the road lines wiggle. And then not with a steering wheel, but with the camera. And that launched me into a new phase of this where I started making some new fun prints. This one I call Armscape. If you look at, you can see it's summer because I have a tan there. My point being that I was, I was, playing. I was breaking out on my box. I was trying to do some things that were different. Fourth idea. Fourth idea. Stay up past bedtime. Or to the adults, I should say, wait for happy hour till later. Push the extremes of when you make photographs. I was putting my tripod away in, the, in Vancouver Island in British Columbia when the moon came up. And I went, wow. I pulled it out and kept working. And since that time, I've made a point of when the moon's out to see what can happen, to use the new technology we have in digital cameras, take my eyes up high and see what can happen with moon photography. And not just the moon coming down on the water, but sometimes it's like waking up in the wee hours and see what the moon looks like as fog is drifting on the lake and the clouds are moving past too. So it's like staying up past bedtime. It's, what I mean by that is push it a bit. I was with a group and everyone went inside. They were finished making photographs. And I said, I'm gonna hang out for a bit. I was leaning my arms on my tripod, just enjoying the ocean because I live in the high desert in the Rocky Mountain area of New Mexico. When these birds landed around me in twilight and started running down to eat and running back up when the waves chased them. I was pushing it because there was no one else on the beach. In Molokai during the pandemic, I snuck off to Hawaii and there were two surfers left in very low light in me. You'll find your creative energy, your creative ideas explode when you start going into the edge of light. You know, the sunset goes down and everyone applauds and everyone leaves when you want to say, wait, this is the best time to be there. Grab your seat and come on back because the show's about to start. Since I'm talking about 
the extreme times of, of light, right? We're talking about, uh, you know, staying late and so forth. Let me just, while we're still on this idea here, this fourth idea, let me just come back to the middle of the day. The photographers love or always talk about avoiding the middle of the day. But I have a lot of fun photographing into the contrast of waves, trying to get these chihuly like glass feelings when I go right into a wave. Or playing with a little electric squiggles of highlights on the creek as the sunlight at high noons coming through the forest canopy. All the reflections that I did full of beautiful New England colors happened in the middle of the day. The sunlight would bounce off the forest canopy and bounce off the shady side of a creek and then come to me. All things we'll talk about in the workshop this weekend and dissect in great deal as people wish. New tools. The fifth idea is to sometimes creative energy can happen or you can keep your creative idea, yeah, energy going, your creative spirit going by picking up a new tool. I had loaded film into some plastic cameras. They cost like $30, Diana's and Holga's, and my favorite was called a debonair. And I made soft focus photographs and then I printed them as photogravures, a beautiful old process that Curtis inspired me. Curtis's portraits of the Native Americans. It's a basically a photo etching where you burn your photographic image into a plate and ink up the plate and put a piece of paper over that plate and then pull it through a big printmaking press, pushing the ink into the paper. So a new tool charged up my creative energy. I've recently been putting film back into cameras and playing with very low light because film has a different aesthetic than digital. I know this sounds funny if you're not a photographer, but if you blow up at 100% film and look at it and blow up a digital file, film is prettier. That's something photographers might talk about. No one else, everyone else thinks that's probably a little wacko. Outside of photography though, new tools, new pursuits. During the pandemic, I was given, I found I was given this easel. You would, I had a Japanese brush and a little bit of water in a bowl and I would come by every day and I'd splatter it. And sometimes I'd bump it and shake it. And I would make these wonderful little, for me only drawings uh, I don't know what you call them, like Sumi Egg. And they look like those characters walking and so forth. Or during the pandemic, I decided to take up pottery. And I realize we're talking right now about new tools, but this had a big impact on my photography. It reinforced ideas in photography. There were big crossovers between the two. Actually, I'm drinking out of that one right now, right here. I had to learn basic skills. I had to learn how to center a piece of clay on the wheel and throw it carefully. But then I also had to celebrate unexpected gifts, to go for serendipitous moments that everything in my aesthetic was not about being precise and exact. Everyone has a different personality in the way they go through life and feel things, but mine needed to be, have some skill in the making, but also be organic this Japanese idea of wabi-sabi talking about imperfection is perfection. And so picking up this new tool of pottery informed my photography. Well, the sixth idea, before I actually get to it, let me show you six photographs, three sets of two. The first photograph in each, I made back around high school. And the second I made when I was more serious about photography. Here's the first set of two. I made this on a backpacking trip to the Great Smoky Mountains. I must have been 16 or 17. And it's my photograph, obviously, of an iris. When I became more serious about photography, I made this photograph of an iris. I hope as we go through these, you'll see a difference in the first and the second. But this was the first photograph I ever made where I was thinking about the place beyond the thing itself. That, that was real important. Here's the second set. All right, so I was, I, went, I was living in the Midwest, grew up in the Chicago area, went to school in Madison, flew out to see my grandmother in the Bay Area, and we went up to Bolinas Lagoon, north of San Francisco. Truth be told, well, I'll back up, I love twilight. To this day, it's my favorite time of day. But the truth be told part is, if you look at my cursor, this is my photograph of a great blue heron. I know, this is, this is true. We'll move past that for a moment. Here's a second photograph I made in a body of work I called The Edge of Light. More recently, it's twilight. I still love twilight, but hopefully you see a difference between the two. Here's the third set. 
I made this also on a trip out to the Bay Area to visit my grandmother. I went up to the Mendocino coast. I love getting wet. I always seem to get wet around water. I'm standing in a creek looking straight down. Obviously, there's some issues that I'm having trouble with, like understanding good light and composition. But look what I did a few years ago in Maine. I'm getting wet again. This, was, this looks like a huge wave in the Pacific, but I'm getting, I'm almost sitting in a little creek, a uh, cascade that's maybe 10 inches tall and having a blast with autumn colors in the sky reflecting below. So the difference between the first and the second, it's partly that I understand my craft better. I understand the tools better, but I think differently. And so that's the sixth idea is to think differently. I used to go in and photograph objects and things. I could bore you endlessly with bad portraits of wildflowers. Specks of dust that were actually eagles way in the distance, like my great blue heron I showed you. But now I think about, well, the, capturing the magic of a moment and the essence of a place. The magic of a moment and the essence of a place. Sometimes I respond very literally. A lot of the images that I make these days are, I am experimental with focus and with movement, but I'm also think very solidly grounding myself in this is what I'm, what I'm seeing, but I'm more concerned about essence and place in the moment. I also find that if I am come to a place that there's a famous landmark and everyone's piled up there, this is a good example. This is Pfeiffer Beach in California. There's a sea cave that 20 years ago, no one was at. Now you'll have 40 photographers at night photographing the sea cave. And other than photographing them doing it on tripods, um, I, I go the other direction and try and find my own essence. And so this sixth idea is to, you know, to think differently. Maybe it's not about the thing so much as a feeling, an essence, a moment that you're trying to capture. It may be the big landscape. In the workshop, we're going to talk about the big view, and we'll talk about intimate landscapes as well, too. Well, the seventh idea. The seventh idea is to explore boundaries. I've talked about this a bit, but I want to bring it down to three specific things. Light and movement and focus. And with light, what I encourage everyone to do is become a student of light. Build a light diary if you want and understand all the attributes. So golden light is the light that only lasts a few minutes, but it makes everyone go, wow. I'm working in a, a long-term project from the roof of this studio right here where I photograph this time of year with these amazing skies. But it's the golden light that makes us go, wow. But there's so many kinds of light to explore twilight. And it's not just to explore the light just to do it because light wraps our photo photographs in aesthetics. Twilight to me can be very contemplative light. It can make you, well, depending on your mood, right? You, this could be solitude, lon loneliness, tranquility, contemplation, quiet. So student of light, understanding that a cloudy day is magnificent for showing off detail and color. So to explore boundaries with light, explore boundaries with movement, to really start to understand how do you stop something? How do you freeze it? Should, what range is, you know, it doesn't matter what shutter speed, it matters what range can do that, right? So um, what, what, what shutter speeds give you slow, soft aesthetics? You know, fast to freeze and slow to, to, to show a different aesthetic. And it's not just with water, it can be with animals. You know, some of us have always hung out firmly and we want everything in focus, but elephants move. So I think understanding the parameters of movement, you know, we love bird photography and we'd like to see exactly the eye of the bird, but isn't it incredible when they all take off at once and fly past you? And so understanding how to do that, the parameters of, of movement. And the last one is focus. There are times when we want to get everything in focus because it, it matters to the, to the photograph. But there are times when we want either nothing in focus or just a touch of focus and everything else is a soft filter of, of out of focus. So that seventh idea is about exploring boundaries of, of light, movement, and focus. So these seven ideas, they, they kind of whirl together for me and they help me go down a path of, of bringing bodies of work into the world. 
And just to share a few with you, and then we'll turn up the lights here, so to speak, and, and see what questions you might have fed into. And remember to feed any questions you have to Jason. I was inspired by, we talked at the beginning about looking at other art, really to, uh, to break outside and be curious. Well, George O'Keefe and other abstract painters would often talk about getting to the essence with not the same detail that let's say Ansel Adams used, really celebrating light, color, and shape. So 20 years ago, I was out in the forest and experimenting with how I could move my camera to, st to distill it down, to distill forest down into light, color, and shape to see if that was a way through to essence, like the painters have been doing. Maples and birches and the white mountains of New Hampshire. When that project finished, I was sitting by the side of a stream one day and noticed these beautiful autumn reflections. I head to Maine every October for a couple of weeks and I'm gifted with yellows and oranges and reds. And I went on a body of work inspired by Monet and other abstract painters, impressionistic colors given the color given to me all by nature and bouncing off a forest above and coming to the shady side of water and then coming to my camera. And that became a project inspired by looking at art and curiosity and these things we've been talking about. Shijo is the name for Japanese screens. Been to Kyoto many autumns with alumni and we often are hanging out in Japanese gardens. And I was thinking, wouldn't it be interesting to photographically respond to honor both the Japanese garden and these translucent screens called shijo. So I switched and instead of using wider and normal lenses like I often do, I used a long lens because it was so good at throwing things out of focus. You know, trying to be positive, instead of complaining a long lens can't get it all in focus, I'm gonna go, that's good. I wanna throw this out of focus. I wanna create a lot of soft filtery feelings to it. And then a project that I still continue to work on, probably because I love water and, the, and twilight, I call it the edge of light. You know, it's that changing of guard between daytime and nighttime. When the baton is being torched, being passed from, day, from the daytime through twilight to nighttime, and really trying to celebrate that magnificent time. I alluded to the fact that you can have the beach all to yourself at that time when these surreal colors are there. So this project also is inspired by these ideas we've been talking about in terms of you know, staying up past your bedtime or being, uh, exploring boundaries of light and movement in particular. Well, in a moment, I'm gonna ask Jason to start uh, sending some questions this way, but I wanna just finish with two thoughts. I'll go to a black screen for a second here, which is one of my pet peeves, I guess, is I'm a, a worry sometimes that if we don't, if we're not careful, our photographs are gonna die in hard drives. They're gonna die in hard drives. And so one of the pieces of advice, and this isn't it's creative, but it's more practical, is to do something with your photographs. And don't overthink it. You know, if you think about a big project you've never done one before, it'll, it could paralyze you. A project I've been working on that's really easy is I make postcards and send them to people. I print them on thick photographic paper. I now gang them up on a big sheet of paper, anything thick that's like a postcard, and I cut them up four by six, and I put an image on one side, and I turn it over, and I write something to a friend on the other side. And the cool thing is they're still around. You can go to the store in your town and buy this little rectangular stamp and put it in the corner, and they'll send it to somebody. So try something simple. Get your photographs out of hard drives and send them to somebody. Give them away. Do something with them. I, you know, in, in terms of postcards, my goal on these is I really hope that they'll achieve the highest place of any photograph, which is on someone's refrigerator. So you might think about that. And let me just wrap up. I've toot my own horn for a second. Um, uh, oh, a few years ago, I made these. I'll hold one up. A set of 144 see, think, do photo cards. There's 144 cards. I've got a few in my hand here. Oop, where's my camera right there? There's a photograph on one side and either a thoughtful or a creative idea on the other side, just some bite-sized information. And I, through the weekend, I, I will discount those. So let me go to that. You're welcome to take a picture of this if you want. Um, I'll, you know, I said today, but I'll go through the weekend since we're doing a workshop. If you put this code in, APC 2021, that'll give you the 10% off and free shipping. If you wanna send me a postcard, there's my address and I'll send you one, just make sure I have your address. So, um, and this is a way to stay in touch. 
So thank you so much for that. I'm gonna jump out, stop sharing my screen and um, come back out into the world here. My main light went off, Jason. So sorry, I, I may be glary here. I've gone to plan B with the light. Oh, no worries at all, Eddie. Thank you so much for, for your talk here and for your inspiration. Um, I, I found myself nodding my head throughout the entire thing because it's it's a lot of the same points that I tell my students uh, in the classroom here at UAF. Nice. Uh, but um, we've we've got some questions coming in. Uh, I know that I have one as well. But um, Irene asks, and this is this is great timing for this. Uh, could you please tell us about your workshop and what it will be like, <laughs> especially now that that uh, and and I do want to pretense this with the fact that you've had to completely change everything that you're doing in in a right. manner of speaking because we've we've gone uh, digital because of of the spike in COVID, the Delta right. variant, and just an overabundance of, of, of caution. So uh, we appreciate you taking so much effort to make this work. The good thing is, is that this builds, uh, this allows a lot more people to attend as well. Yeah. So I'll, I'll let you talk a little about what you're doing. Right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to take many of the sessions I was going to do in Anchorage and, and a couple new ones too, and build them into, we start tomorrow evening and I want to lay the seeds. I want to look at some other photographers work. I want to look at the group's work a little bit for fun, just to get to know each other. On Saturday, we're going to meet for a two hour session, take a break and then two hour session, the same on Sunday, but then there'll be a third wrap up. And what I wanna do is start planting the seeds of creative ideas into these sessions, excuse me, and then have people head off into their backyards, a city park, somewhere close by and make a photograph or two around these ideas and upload them to me before the next session. And we'll be able to look at them. When I review images, as much as I'll point out something that might not be working if uh, gently, because I don't know folks that well, so I don't want to go, you know, Jason, why did you do that? I, I want to nurture the creative side. I think every image has ideas in it to, to flush out and figure out. So it's really a chance over the weekend to try new ideas. And I've always thought it's this marriage of being, you know, creative on one side and thoughtful on the other, those two halves of the loaf coming together. Um, I think it's going to be a dynamic weekend. It's the first time I've broken it down. I taught a ton online last year, but not where we came back two hours later with some images and then did it again. So it's going to be, I think, rapidly moving. And uh, I hope it'll really churn the creative pot and give people a chance to try some new things. Oh, they, hey, you know, Jason, let me throw in one other thing. I just want to toot APC's horn here because I teach natural eye a lot in different places. This is the most reasonably priced workshop I've ever seen. So just to point it out, it's, I've been teaching this for different venues three to four times as much for tuition. So good for you guys. Sure, and actually let me really quickly run to the website and get that link for everyone so that they can directly look at it. We've uh, drastically reduced <laughs> the price because we know that this is changing format, but we also want people to uh, have this, this open, opportunity to really uh, connect with with a photographer. So uh, we appreciate your flexibility, but we're, we're hoping that a lot of people uh, grab onto this. And you, you're right, as someone that, that goes to a lot of uh, workshops on the outside, this is incredibly inexpensive for right. or it's 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 definitely definitely worth your while to consider it. So um, uh, it's a great opportunity for everyone. Uh, so we've got a couple questions coming in. Um, Nikki asks, regarding wildlife photography, do you have any tips for marrying the artistic and imaginative with the straightforward and informative that dominates the genre? Are there ethical concerns? Wow, there's, there's a lot packed in that question. I don't consider myself a wildlife photographer. I've been lucky to to be a photo leader in Tanzania and Namibia many times. And so I, I play with it, have fun. And I admire the great wildlife photographers. I think about Franz Lanting. You know, I think about, um, oh, Jim Brandenburg. But Franz is amazing how he will, I don't know, maybe I'm exaggerating this, but my sense is he'll, he'll bury himself in the, in the water in the Okanagan Delta waiting for the elephants to show up. He's got the photograph figured out. 
the best photographs, wildlife photographs to me, go way beyond the thing itself. They, the thoughtfulness of the entire photograph. That's why they're so far and few between to find these amazing photographs where you want to look at everything. It may be about the focus on the animal, but wow, what a beautiful dappled color behind it. What a thoughtful background. Um, a couple things she touched on, Irene, that you mentioned, I'll, I'll hit briefly is sometimes I will get it out of my system, just the, the photographs that are every day, you might say. And then I'll, I'll make myself remember, I want to do something different. I want, it's just like if you go to a new city, you're in Rome for the first time, you make everything, tourist pictures, and you go, wait a second, I need to, I, I promised myself I wouldn't do that. You know, post-it note to be creative. So the same thing with animals is like, no, today it's going to be about whatever it is, multiple exposures of giraffes or panning animals in low light. Ethical considerations you brought about, yeah, huge. Um, I'm not willing to do something that gets in the way of the animal, its well-being, stress levels of animals and things. I, I, personally, I would much rather, this is me, see the animal in the environment than the eyeball of the animal. And so I would rather back off and learn more about it and see more about it than to scare it. Excellent, thank you so much. Uh, Let's see, uh, so, uh, let's go with Adrian Levine's got a question, or well, not a question, they, they just wanna comment that they have an iris photo that a friend looked at and said that it was their mother's favorite flower with a tear in their eye as his mother had passed the year before and he gave them, uh, them the picture. I think that there's, there's a lot to talk about there with, with the, emotional potential for photography and, yeah. and conveying that to your audience. Yeah. Um, going further, uh, Sarah Manriquez uh, wants to follow up the question that, that you answered regarding documentary style photography. Uh, so going back to that earlier question about uh, ethical considerations and, and how do you marry uh, artistic and imaginative with with documentary style. What what do you think about that? Are you speaking about ethical things mostly? Ethical considerations? Uh, or, I, I believe so. Um, I mean, because if, if you take the question the same way we did with wildlife, that you know, going from standard something just in focus, and you get it to being more playful or creative same things apply, you know, you, you have to think that this is what I'm going to be doing. Sure. Um, show up in low light on the streets of Havana to play with kids playing soccer, that sort of thing. Ethically, um, yeah, I may be a, a fuddy-duddy, I don't know, if, I haven't used that word in forever. Um, I'm, I would much rather sit at a table with guys playing checkers in Havana now and talk to them and learn about their lives than photograph them. I, it's just where I've come to come to be. My livelihood's not been based upon people photography, but a lot of my peers have done it. And I, they brought a lot of awareness to our world about other cultures. I feel uncomfortable bringing people into a place and just sort of, you know, it's like a trip to the zoo and that's not right. I think I, much, I feel much better sitting down having a cup of tea or coffee with someone learning about their lives and if it's appropriate to make a picture. But I'm not a street photographer. I'm not a documentary photographer. This is my sensitivity to stepping over. Sure, and I think I'm there with you as well. There's just certain photographs that I see, you know, every time that I go to Denali and I see everyone on the side of the road looking at the, the bear, I just keep on going. Um, that's just not my, my type of photography. Mm -hmm. uh, although I'm sure that there's a lot of people that would say I'm crazy for not, not taking that photo. Um, but you, may, you but probably yeah. can't hear this right now, but there's coyotes really howling up, howling it up right outside the door. <laughs> At least three of them. Anyway, sorry. Wow. Uh, Adrian asks uh, another question about the workshop. Um, when, what time will the Zoom sessions be? I know that you've got some for Friday evening and then Saturday and then Sunday as well. My memory is, and, and uh, Bonnie could correct me on this, I think it's 5.30 to 8 or 8.30 tomorrow, all Alaska time. And I'll put breaks in there. It's way too long to be on Zoom. I think 9 to 11, 
on Saturday and Sunday, and then maybe one to three on Saturday and Sunday, and then a wrap up at four to five on Sunday. That's my memory. Sure. Great. Okay. So um, Ziggy asks, how do you capture a sense of place? What are the components you consider? Well, it's a great question. I mean, and it's a complicated one too, because everyone will do this differently. I think the key for me is to spend time in the place. I mean, one of my big I, big things for me is to spend time in a place without a camera. I can fail right away if I go right into a place and start making pictures. It's like, I don't even know where I am. What's there? What's the potential? As I hang out in a place and I go back, like I, go, like I said, I've gone back to Northern Maine for over 20 years now. I'm seeing an old friend. It changes. One year there's a drought, one year there's a lot of water, one year the colors are early, one year they're late, and I change in how I respond. So Ziggy, I respond best if I get to know a place, if I have quality time in it. So therefore, if you're going on a trip, I will not spend one night in every village in Italy. I'll spend days and days and days. And I've come home with much more than just a checklist of places I've been. But I interpret things over time differently. So a good example is the bodies, some of the bodies of work I showed you. I was interpreting essence at one time by moving my camera and trying to distill all the forest detail down into light color and shape. Someone else might go in and say, no, 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 the essence for me are all little macro details. And someone else might say, no, it's about the, it's about the, the weather here. It's about the rainstorms and snowstorms and things. So I think everyone will come in through a path of essence and you may come in through many, but I think the key is spend time to get to know the place. I'll add one last thing. I can keep thinking of other stuff, but one thing too is I've changed how I photograph over time. So I might've come in 10 years ago and camera on a tripod, everything down to F22, sharp front to back. I still do that, but now I'm much, I, I might say, no, I'm gonna put focus strongly on that birch leaf and have a soft forest behind. And that's how I see essence now. Excellent. Uh, Mike Conti asks, do you ever find that you bring too much equipment how do you find the right balance of having what you need and bringing too much? Yeah. Um, I've made big mistakes by having too many things going on at once. I'll bring too much equipment and then I'll have, oh, I'm going to bring my, my four by five field camera and I'm going to bring my plastic camera. It's like, no way. It's, I, I will fail big time. Um, I will, before the trip, think, what is this about? So let's say I'm going to a city. I just came back from Italy. Let's say I'm going there again, or let's say I'm going wherever it may be. I think, so what am I going to get out of this photographically? For me, it's not a body of work I'm working on. It might be an important photograph along the way. So I will bring smaller and lesser equipment because I just, it's not why I'm there. I'm there to learn from the culture. These days, I'm thinking of also going with just this. If it's a trip where it's not, where photography is not my prime thing. However, when I was just on the California coast, I brought my major uh, DSLR equipment, which means I have two bodies and three lenses. And it fits nice in a camera bag and I don't overdo it beyond that. And I have a backup body in case because I'm working on a project there. I'm working on um, a body of work. So Mike, it's a great question. I've just failed enough that I've also realized I'm at a more peaceful point in my life, more contemplative that I would rather bring this and, and see that way than worry that I'm not gonna get that, that, and that. Because usually that, that, and that uh, makes you trip. And one other thing, and I'm, I keep thinking of these things, look at some of your favorite photographers and my favorite photographers often use one camera, one lens. I'm there with you, Eddie. Uh, oh. I, I've gotten some strange looks from people um, going around with my, my fixed lens uh, mirrorless camera, but uh, I love photographing that way. Um, so uh, as a follow-up, Mike asks, um, what are your three lenses that you do bring? Right now I have a fixed 20 and a fixed 60 that's also a macro and a 70 to 200. And I like fixed lenses, uh, prime lenses. 
a buddy of mine, I, uh, for years I spoke for Geographic on with Mike, Michael Melford and we would travel the country for like eight years or so we went all over and Michael would have two bodies. And as I recall, um, a zoom that went from wide to normal and then a longer lens that went normal long. And he covered everything that way. I, uh, and he was on assignment. He was under great pressure to get things done that way. Whereas I find that with a prime lens, I've trained myself to move to the photograph rather than stand and zoom to it. So I've made great peace with these lenses. And of those three lenses, the 60 that's also a macro and the 20 are my most common. So that gets, if I want, I'll just bring that and let go of the big weight. And if I go somewhere to Africa and there's gonna be wildlife, I'll get a longer lens, borrow one or something. Sure. So, uh... I think we've gone through all of the questions. So I've got mine and I'm sure that a couple of our board members that are here as, as uh, part of the panel so they can speak up at any point. They don't need to type it in the chat. So um, I've, I've got a question kind of related to those first statements that you said about uh, jurors and, and how much you internalize what they have to say about your work, you know, whether or not, uh, and, and I think that's a good way to like bring back everything that you've been talking about, about inspiration and, and jurors, because I've found that some, some artists really fixate on, on the uh, interests of what jurors pick and, and what ends up in which exhibitions. And you've, they find themselves photographing more of what the juror wants in in these couple of shows that they've been in uh where that kind of goes against that idea of just playing and and coming coming up with with whatever's in front of you and and being inspired by the moment and so do you find did you ever find yourself shooting for the results of what you wanted the, the the juror to see, or what the juror liked, or did you just kind of throw that to the wind, and every every submission was new? Yeah, I, I pretty much didn't follow what the jurors were about. Um, I mean, I didn't I didn't go on and research what they liked or who they were or anything like that. Um, I guess my biggest piece of advice on this, and I follow it all the time, is to, you know, do this for yourself. It's, it's the most important thing. I, when I teach, and I teach often, <clears throat> sorry, I'm sort of losing my voice here. First time back on Zoom in a while, I guess. But when I, um, when I teach, this is a rough figure, but like 95% of the people are not making a living at this, maybe 98%. And therefore, do it for yourself. Do it completely for yourself. And I would much rather, you know, a couple of the stories that relate to this, I think. I one time, and I've, I've done this a little movie at times, but you go into, go into Google Images and type in something famous like Antelope Canyon, Arizona. And at least down in this in the lower 48, it's a popular, hugely popular spot for photographers to go. And it could be you, you try type in where the grizzlies go and brooks or wherever you type in things that are common and then sit back, go get a cup of coffee and come back and wait for Antelope Canyon to load. It's going to be thousands and thousands of images and almost and then then gather all those photographers together and say, OK, everybody here in Google Images, bring a print. We're going to get in a big circle and they're all in the circle holding their print. And a big windstorm comes along and takes all the prints out of their hands and shuffles them up and they drop in a pile on the floor. The challenge is, can you find your print? Because they're all so similar. And it's, you know, it's the biggest kiss of death. Of course, if you want to get into a show, if you want to get into a magazine, the last thing you want to send Arizona highways is the slot canyon. Um, it's, it's, but nothing wrong with going there. What an amazing place. But if you're trying to make a mark in photography, I would not follow what a juror's done or follow what someone else has done. I would do it for you. And that's hard. We often emulate. You know, I, I joke too, you could go over to Point Lobos in California. And if you look carefully, you can find the Weston tripod holes. Or going to Yosemite, you see Ansel's tripod holes because the pilgrimage has gone there to, to do that. But that's fine if you need to emulate. But at some point, you want to turn around and go your own direction, whether it's literally turning around, like I suggested, 
or coming in here or here and saying, what do I want to say? What do I have to say? And because we think that we're done with photography, we're not at all. There's so many things, personal things to, to speak of, a place you know better than any, anyone else. And so I'm sort of going on and on here, Jason, but um, yeah, I think it's, it's about not looking at what the juror is doing and looking at what you want to do. And that's not easy, but it's, it's a good journey. Thank you. That's, that's quite insightful and everything we need to hear. So yeah, I try you. and follow it too. Um, if I'm not seeing any other questions, so I want to kind of open it up to our, our board here, Matt, Petra, uh, Mike, or, or Bonnie. Now, Petra, I wanted any to questions? close with some things at some point. Yeah, I, are, are there any other questions? Because uh, if there aren't, um, then I'll jump in. Matt or Mike or anybody else? No, I, I don't hear. Um, I've been sitting here smiling throughout your lecture, Eddie. It's been very inspirational. So thank you. And um, thanks everyone who has been here with us tonight. And uh, I think the people in the workshop are in for a real treat. Um, it's been wonderful. So Eddie, I hope you get some good rest <laughs> before tomorrow. And uh, yes, I, I am, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing about the workshop and um, I wish you the best of luck. So thank you and good night, everybody. Thank you all so much. Enjoy your photography. Thanks, Jason, for helping out. See you all tomorrow, those of you in the workshop.